take, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so we'll find out as we go along. Well, as listen, as for always, we start out the broadcast and then we figure out how we're doing because <laughs> you know, yeah, right. <laughs> on a daily basis. But uh, uh, really good to have you along now. It, it has been Easter week. Um, stuff about Easter, what it actually means, what the meaning that is generally spoken to in a societal way is out there. Uh, you know, the, the, the culture that's been created around the ideas of Easter. But you know what? We missed a couple of things. Um, and, and a few people have questions because there were bombings in Sri Lanka that were apparently aimed at some churches. And I'm going to cover that in the news later on, uh, you know, probably tomorrow for sure on Tuesday, but also uh, various other days. I'm going to have to get deep into it. But uh, so there's a couple of questions about that that are kind of sitting behind. But outside of that, you know what we skipped last week is uh, Mm. the whole rest of the, the oddity of the culture and the time of year you started discussing it. And I think I probably derailed the conversation. Because, you know, it is springtime. It is a time of rebirth, generally speaking, in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. Um, And there's a couple of symbols that are sort of, I don't know, just, you know, there's all these explanations (laughs) about why it is there's colored eggs and a bunny and all these other interesting things that are added into the Easter culture. Um, You know, and and you didn't even talk about the, the meaning of the word Easter itself, by the way during that discussion, which uh, which I think we should cover because, look, it's only, the what, the day after now. Um, again, you know, the day after the Easter holiday, the Easter week, and they stressed it when they were covering this during the news that this is like the holiest week for all Christendom, uh, so on and so forth. So I think it still needs to be addressed a little more. And these other symbols. Um, there's also something else that I'm going to have to pull up that I, there was a conversation on Twitter that involved you, but I'm going to have to go get that because I just remembered it when uh, somebody started describing things as pagan and I found it kind of funny and I'm going to run it by you. But um, how about we get into this concept of spring and Easter and the eggs and see, I, I, I am what I call a pagan. So I have my own ideas about what the colored eggs mean, but uh, uh, I'd yeah. like you to break it down though. And uh, you know, let's begin there if you don't mind. Well, let's begin with what, what do you think the, the colored eggs represent? Well, there's certainly a symbol of fertility, um, and this is at the same time when various pagan belief systems, at the same time of year, Easter, uh, when, when springtime would come to the Northern Hemisphere again, uh, where fertility was much in the uh, in the practices. Yeah, in the, in the picture, yeah. yeah. And, and Every, uh, all the plants begin to grow, all the animals get, begin to reproduce. And they, and then later on, they're having their young, and they grow. And as, and as spring grows into summer, the animals have have all reproduced. Uh, everything that's alive is reproducing, and there's so much color. All the flowers and, and plants and trees and color is everywhere, especially with flowers around the northern hemisphere. You got the beautiful, beautiful flowers. And so the color is very big with spring. There's no color period in winter. It's just frozen. But in spring, it's very colorful with all the plants and the animals and the different color uh, you know, animals that, that we have. And they're all reproducing, coming up with new, new of spring. And so this is why the animals come out in the spring, because it's getting warm and Life is changing. Life is coming back to the northern hemisphere. And so that's why even we humans, we start thinking the same way. That's why we have spring weddings, because we're getting ready to reproduce again. We didn't have enough babies, enough people were going to reproduce again. So now we're getting spring weddings, and the humans are going to get together, and it's going to be very colorful. And so that's why you have the egg, because the egg represents a reproduction of life. And actually, if you go back to the old Phoenician Canaanites, thousands with the, the worship of the lights and spring and the coming back to life, and she held in her arms a rabbit. And the rabbit always represented fertility. 
it represented the the uh, continual reproduction of life because rabbits are always reproducing. And so that's why the rabbit became important even thousands of years ago in the symbolism. Because the rabbit represented some, uh, an animal that just reproduces without stop. And so uh, the rabbit becomes important back in two, you know, three or four thousand years ago back in the in the ancient world of Phoenicia, Cana, where we call today Israel, in that area of the world, there was actually a goddess in, in spring, and she was carrying a rabbit. And the red hat was carrying an egg. And so this is the idea behind the, the Easter egg. The egg represents fertility, and that's when animals and plants and everything else begins to reproduce itself when the sun comes back to the northern hemisphere in spring. And so we, and what, what causes that to happen is that the sun, which was dead for three days in winter, is gone down south is dead, but to us in the northern hemisphere is dead. And so when it comes back, it starts its annual journey on the, December 25th, it starts its annual journey back to the northern hemisphere. And three months later, 90 degrees and 90 days later, uh, it has come back to the Northern Hemisphere and officially, 90 days later, it officially crosses over the equator. Coming back to the Northern Hemisphere, it actually crosses our equator. And so that time was very special to the ancient people because it represented life coming back to the northern hemisphere. Everything's going to, all the plants are going to begin to grow, etc. And so, um, well, this is a practical matter because, first of all, there's a lot of agrarian societies at that point which depended on their agriculture. So what did you do? You, you, you stored things for the winter because nothing was going to grow, number one. So uh, you, you had to know that this was the time when the earth was going to soften up again. It wasn't going to be hard. It was going to be fertile, you know, and useful That's to right. plant a seed again, to plant seeds, to plant a seed, whatever. Uh, but also, you know, the idea that all the colors are on the eggs, the reason why the colors are there is because in a literal sense during spring, this is when colors would emerge directly because what happens? Flowers bloom. Very practical. Again, Flowers yeah, that's what I said. The flowers are all representing beautiful colors. Right. And they it all represents variety. the coming back of life. Right. Life was coming back on the in the northern hemisphere. All the birds are reproducing, the animals are reproducing, the, the beautiful flowers, all kinds of just hundreds of thousands of beautiful flowers coming back to life in the spring. And so it's a big celebration for life coming back to the earth. But Jesus said he would come back. And Jesus is God's son, the light of the world. So the son is coming back. He is coming back to bring life to the world. And as I said last week, the Egyptians understood that the sun was pure energy. Pure energy. And so energy is life. And the sun was life itself. It was the progenitor of energy so it was life itself and the ancient people said that if the sun were to be stingy and keep its its energy and not share it with us the sun would ultimately last forever because it's energy and energy is life but the sun for some reason decided to share his energy with us and so therefore god's son is dying because the sun is giving his energy up for us continually. And obviously, he's going to run out of energy one day. It may be billions of years, but he's going to run out of energy one day. And the sun is a star, and the star will die. And so, therefore, the ancient people said that God's son, the light of the world, the one we call Jesus, he was God's son. He gave his life so that you might live. He died so that you might live. Uh, and the symbolism is the sun is dying each day because it's giving his energy away. And therefore, he's going to die completely when he runs out of energy. But thank God he won't do that for a while. <clears throat> but the sun will die when, so ultimately, God's son is dying and giving his life so that you might live. <clears throat> Very simple. 
Right. Now, now here, here's an interesting thing that I want to interject here, because th- th- this is fascinating when we take a look at the story that's told that goes along with what you're explaining. All right. Because uh, th- th- this was the Holy Week. Right. And uh, so so a lot of people took notice that these churches were attacked in, in Sri Lanka at this time during Easter services, literally on Easter. Um, but what, what's fascinating about that is that uh, it, it's because it's at a time period. The reason why these kind of things are done during, you know, say Easter or whatever, is because regardless of how, you know, some people think it's like, a, a you know, a, a, an attack on Easter itself. It's really an attack to inspire even more attention. You know, uh, a church is being attacked on another day might not be quite as attention getting, number one. So so I'm going to leave that alone for a minute because the image and the thing that started on Twitter where your name came up in the conversation was was kind of funny. Uh, another person had tweeted a, a picture and said, you know, that this is a very interesting Holy Week and all that, but there's some strange customs that go along with it. And what did they do? They, they pulled up a Getty image uh, dressed as a Roman soldier. And what he's doing is holding one of those, what they call a flagellant or, you know, one of the whips with the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the thing from the Passion of the Christ play, let's call it, that actually literally has hooks on the end of it and strips the skin. This mm-hmm. is something that we've seen as a torture device before. If you haven't seen Mel Gibson's movie, you probably heard it described somewhere. But anyway, he's holding that and there's a couple of these victims that have been, uh, you know, whipped that are uh, on either side of him. And it's a Getty image, which is a representative of this passion play. Um, seems rather intense to me that it, it, we, we, we have a story where, yes, the son is represented by the character of Christ and all of that. But what, what do you think the point of, because somebody said to me in this conversation, which went a little strange and sideways, what would Jordan Maxwell have to say is the symbolism? Um, well, I can answer it. Yeah, please. I can answer that. The, the reason why there was a, the, we're, we're given the understand that Jesus was tortured is because he said himself, of himself, he said in the scriptures, I am the truth and the light. Therefore, since he is the truth and the light, what is being said there symbolically as a metaphor is that Jesus, every time you read about Jesus in the New Testament, you're reading about the truth and the light. And therefore, whatever happens to the truth and the light happened to Jesus, whatever was said about Jesus, that's what is said about the truth and light. Whatever is done to Jesus, that's what the world does to the truth and the light. So Jesus simply represents symbolically the truth and the light. And therefore, we know that the world is not interested, generally speaking, in the truth or the light. The, you know, We have the story, <clears throat> the symbolic story, that makes the point very clearly, if you remember, the governor of the city, I can't remember what it was, I think it was, uh, um, oh, what was the governor's name Pontius in the Pilate, Bible? Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate. Was Pontius the prefect Pilate. of Judea at that time <clears throat> under the Roman yeah, and he, But he brings Jesus out, and he brings out a, a man, another man that was in prison, and he says to the city, the whole city is, is there at this big, gathering and the and the governor of the city says to the people uh, once a year uh, i can i can release a prisoner one prisoner i can release as the governor and i can release him so today we have two people that were in prison we have a man named barabbas and everyone knows barabbas who he is he's very famous for being who he is he's a criminal and a liar and that's why he's been in prison all these years. He's a criminal and a liar, and there's no good in him. I so think he's on, the, school, he's on my like, left side. And yeah. then uh, you see the picture, and you hear this, you read it. Well, I think in Sunday then, school they told me he was a murderer, too. Is that- yeah, probably so. 
probably would because the, the lies are killing. You know, they are killers. Well, that's true too. Yeah. So, so and so, uh, and so then he said, and on my right, I have a man that uh, I have Jesus, who is very famous for healing the sick and raising the dead and trying to make peace with the whole world of mankind and make everyone uh, and help everyone to get a better light. So he represents the truth and the light. Which one do I, uh, I give to you? And the scripture says in the Bible that with one voice, there was no dissension. With one voice, everyone in the city cried, give us Barabbas. That's very famous in scripture in the Bible. It says when Jesus was presented, Barabbas was presented. The whole city said, give us Barabbas. Why? It's a symbolic truth about life. When the, when the city or the person or the, or the family or the city or the county or the state or the country or the people of the earth are presented with the truth and the light or the lie, the murderous lies and criminality, the people, the humans on the earth will always say, give us Barabbas. We don't want the truth in the light. Like the movie said, you know, what do you want from me? And the boy said, I want the truth. And the guy said, you can't handle the truth. So that was the story in the Bible when Pontius Pilate is presenting the, the murderous uh, criminal and Jesus representing the truth in the light. The people said, you Rabbis, why? Because you can't handle the truth. You don't. You don't want the truth. The truth and the light is not, is to be put to persecuted, or nailed to a stake and let it die. Nobody is interested in the truth and the light. We want to hear what we want to hear. We want to hear what we will support. We we, we will pay big money to our churches. We will put a lot of money into churches and preachers. So they can drive around and fly around in their, in their you know, in their beautiful uh, jet planes and their Lincolns and their Continentals. And they can live very high. Why? Because we'll pay them because they tell us what we want to hear. We want to hear that the Lord loves us and that no matter what we all of that, that's what we want to hear. We don't want to hear the truth and the light. We don't care about the truth and the light. Get rid of it. Hang it up, hang, nail it to a stake. Well, here, here's the thing about that, though, Jordan. It, it, it's very much like the election process in, in, in America, too. And I'll tell you why. Because you, you give us this thing that uh, that we want to hear. Sure, that's one part of it. But it's also uh, uh, don't don't give us the, the thing we're not used to. Uh, and, and also give us the easy way because look, I can send this guy money and I've got my spot reserved for me in heaven. Right. Yep, uh, you know, right. so real easy. I don't have to behave correctly. I don't have to be an honest person. I don't have to stop being a hypocrite. I can just send money to this guy and I've got a spot. It's all good. Uh, that's, I mean, that's true. That's exactly right. So, so here's the thing about that though, is, is instead of taking, like when I see a politician come out and actually speak the truth, my first thought is this guy's got no chance of getting anywhere because that's <laughs> the end of it. As soon as he does it, he's gone. You know, yeah. that, that, that's that's pretty much the way it works. The second one of these guys really starts to tell you the truth, you know, either they, they have an accident uh, or, or suddenly, well, you know. that would be my thought. When I hear someone <laughs> actually saying what is true, I'm thinking how long is this guy going to be alive to see the sun come up? Yeah. Yeah, so but, but it is though, assassinated soon. It's, it, it's easy, you know. No, give me the guy that lies to me because I know how that works. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's right? like us. He's, he's one of he's one of the the hood. He's uh, one of the the brothers in the hood. Pretty he's much, like us. I mean, he's a lying thief, and and uh, and he knows what he's doing. He's a criminal, and so are we. We we're lying and cheating, and we're criminals too. And so he's one of us. He's one of our boys. He's one of the home boys. We get somebody out there who actually wants to do something to help the the people of the world. And well, they'll kill him. Right. They'll assassinate him in front of you. And there's nobody. And nobody will go to jail. Nobody goes to prison when you kill a good man. Well, see, and so back, you, back to pilot. See, back to pilot and Barabbas. Though it's perfect because it's like we know that this guy is a criminal. 
Yeah, okay. exactly. We, we know that that's exactly. But, but let us let us have him. And the funny thing about that story, because let's continue on with it, is that oh, Pilate says, "Okay, I'm going to take him and punish him." Now, according to the story, this is where the flagellants come in, right? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, according to what we've always been, the skin from his back, pretty much like Mel Gibson showed you in that movie. Uh, uh, and uh, he's still alive. He brings him out again and says, look, I've done this. This is what I've decided to do with him. And uh, the crowd is not satisfied that the truth has been tortured this much, right? Symbolically, he's the truth. So they're not satisfied that you've wounded the truth. They want it gone. Uh, and, and, and Pilate washes his hands of the situation, <laughs> You know, basically says, look, I'm not responsible for this. Literally, there there is a, a part of the story where he washes his hands as well, right? Yeah, well, that's exactly what happened to the guy with uh, WikiLeaks. I mean, they, they didn't, they're they not just on, oh, they want him dead. They want to, the, the powers that be want him brought back here. We're going to kill him. We're going to wish, he's going to wish to hell he had never been born telling the people the truth. And like He's going to wish he'd never been born. So I'll arrest him, beat him up, beat his face in, and bloody him up, and bring him back to America. We're going to torture him and nail him to a stake. And that's, that's how much we Americans love the truth and the light. And so that's exactly what's going on today. Anybody who stands up for the truth is going to end up nailed to a cross, symbolically. You're going to be nailed. You're going to, like Jesus said, the, the slave is no greater than the master. What they've done to me, they will do to you. They didn't listen to me, and what makes you think they're going to listen to you? So if you try and go out and tell the people what's really going on, like a young man did that was working with the NSA, and he's going to come out and tell us what the NSA, the government's really doing with your information, we will throw him in the prison and make him wish to hell he had never been born. We'll find every kind of criminal act against him, and we'll make him wish he had left the world. Because we'll teach him a lesson. Don't you ever act like you're going to share the truth and the light with the people. The people don't want no truth and the light. They want to know that their government, no matter if it's a Nazi, fascist, communist government, Moscow or Berlin, and it's murdering people all over the world, we want to know our government is protected. We don't want to hear no truth and light. Period. At the end of the day, that's the bottom line. We're not interested in your truth and light. And so, therefore, it is said you can't handle the truth. That's what the military guy said in the court. You can't handle the truth. And so that's what's going on in the Bible. It's a symbolic story where Jesus represents symbolically the spirit of truth and light. And uh, so... I have said that there's so much more symbolism all around the holidays. And why do we have holidays? That's another point I want to bring out. Why do we have Christmas and Easter and the different holidays and Labor Day and all that? Well, Labor Day comes from the communists. And so because they control the labor, the labor unions, and that's why you have a painter's union and the pastor's union and the carpenter's union and the Soviet union, because it's all based on the collective the collecting bargaining and collective unionism, which is, goes back to the Soviet union. But uh, it's interesting why we have holidays. Because, as I said before, if you draw a circle, a perfect circle, and then you put 360 dots around the circle and spread them out around the circle, 360 dots represents 360 degrees of the circle. We always we always divide the circle into 360 degrees. Why? Because the ancient Babylonians did that. They're the ones that told us to draw a circle and put 360 dots around it. That's a Babylonian, an ancient Sumerian Babylonian idea. And we're still following it today. And then they divided that into uh, four parts. You draw a line from one, uh, from one dot directly across the circle, exactly directly across the circle, and you hit the 180th degree. Uh, 180, and then you draw another 
uh, you go another 90 degrees, and now you can draw another cross across the circle, and that cross is, uh, crosses the other one. So now you have a perfect cross within a circle. And you divided the circle into four parts. You now have spring, summer, autumn, winter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four Gospels are telling you the story of God's Son, the light of the world. And so ultimately, the Bible is telling you in a symbolic way, symbolically, not in history, but symbolically, the Bible is telling you about the oldest story the world has ever heard. The oldest story that the world has ever known is called the greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told is the war between the sun and the darkness of night, the war between light and darkness. Ultimately, on, the, on this earth, the ultimate war in this world is, is for the minds of men, the war between intellectual, spiritual, enlightenment, and truth, as opposed to the lies and murderous lies and criminality. So there's a war in heaven between the gods, the gods of the darkness and the gods of light. The light is always at war with the, with the, uh, with the darkness. And this is why God's son, when he is born each morning, he chases away the demons and the old devil, who is a prince of darkness. And so the prince of darkness in Egypt was named Seth. And so when Horus, the, the god of the sun, comes, chases Horus away. And Horus is the god of and Horus is the god of darkness. I mean, Horus is the god of light, and he chases away his evil brother, which was Seth. Why? Because Seth was the god of darkness. We, they realized it got dark at sunset, and so Seth was the god of darkness. But when Horus uh, controls the whole world, when the sun is high overhead, we say it's high noon. What time would that be? If it's at 12, 12 high noon. And so there's a story in the Bible, according to the symbolism, Jesus is supposedly at 12 years old. He's 12 years old in the temple teaching the wise men. And we're told that he, we always shown pictures of Jesus as a, as a 12-year-old boy teaching all the wise men. No, no, that's, that's history. And there is no history in the Bible. It's a symbolic story that the truth and the light at 12 noon is as bright as it's going to get. So if you can't get it in your head, the truth and the light about anything at 12 noon, you're not going to get it at all because there is no brighter light on the earth than at 12 noon. So that 12 noon, God's son, the light of the world, is teaching all the important people of the world whatever it is they're supposed to learn. They're teaching you something at 12 noon. And if you can't learn at 12 noon, then you're not going to learn at all. You're not getting it at all. So symbolically, that Jesus was not 12 years old teaching the wise men. Jesus is the God's son. He's the son at 12 noon when he is so bright, everybody who's anybody is listening to and trying to learn whatever they're trying to learn at 12 noon because there's no more light on the earth than at 12 noon. So Jesus was not 12 years old. as talking about 12 noon. When the sun becomes known as the most high God, because it don't get any higher than high noon. It's a symbolic story. There was no real history of a man at all. And this is why the, 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 the celebration of Easter is very interesting, because in the really ancient, ancient world, we could go back to the very ancient world, as far back as we can go, and spring was not always called Easter or spring. We didn't know it as spring or Easter. It was recorded that in the ancient world, they recognized this particular time of year, and they called it the marriage feast of the Lamb, the marriage feast of God. And they said God's son was with his mother, and they went to a marriage feast. In the story in the Bible, Jesus goes to this marriage feast with his mother, Mari, Mary, no, Mari, M-A-R-I, not M-A-R-Y. Mari is a Virgo, Virgo the Virgin, constellation of Virgo. And so Jesus goes to this marriage feast, 
And we are told that his mother, uh, when they ran out of wine, there were so many people there, the wine was gone very quickly. So the mother, Mari, goes and tells her son, Jesus, to that the, that the party has run out of wine. And she wants him to make wine for the people. So it says Jesus went out and he... Uh, and, and he took the water, he got water, and turned it into wine. That's a story in the Bible. It's not history, it's a symbolic story, because that's what happens. Mother, Mother Mari is actually Mother Earth, Mother Nature. Mother Nature asked God's Son, the Son, the Earth asked God's Son to draw water, which it does. It evaporates the oceans. It draws water. And the water becomes heavy and comes over and out over the land, and it rains. That water that, that Jesus, or God's Son, has uh, drawn is now pouring over. It's over the fields, and it's raining on the grapes, and the grapes we smash and make it into wine. So God's Son has changed water into wine. It's a symbolic story. The entire New Testament is a metaphor, a symbolic metaphor. And uh, but men have made the story into something which is supposed to be uh, legitimately history. When in point of fact, there was no man who rose from the dead. There was no man who died and came back. No one is coming back to save us. Nobody. No one is coming back to save the human race. And when you die, you will not be going into heaven with God's son to see your family. You're going into what is called in the Hebrew, Sheol. S-H-E-O-U-L. Sheol was uh, a word for hell. So you're going into the common kind when you leave this world. You're not going into the sun. You're going into hell or you're going into a grave. And for you then, you will finally experience what we call the end of the world. That's right. You will finally experience what is called the end of the world. Because it's the end of the world for you. Everybody else will be doing fine, but you're gone. So it's the end of the world for you. And that's why it's a very interesting story when you start looking at Christianity as a metaphor, a symbolic story of the war between light and darkness, between the good and evil. We give us Barabbas, give us the, the criminal. We don't want the truth and the light. We can't handle the truth. We want, uh, we want to hear what we're paying people to tell us. We want to hear what we want to hear. And so, therefore, the, all the preachers around uh, in North America and all the preachers in Christendom, they will tell the people what they want to hear, but they won't tell them too much, like an education. They're not going to tell them nothing that has anything to do with education or how to read and how to think. No, they're not going to do that. They're going to tell you what you want to hear about how wonderful heaven will be and how your family is there waiting for you in heaven with the Lord. And all of that is a wonderful story, but it has no basis in fact whatsoever. And uh, this is why I think the, the, the what uh, Rodney Dangerfield said was so was so clever, and it was really funny. But I think it was Rodney Dangerfield who said that faith, people who have faith, faith is that wonderful quality that allows you to believe something you know is bullshit. And so that's exactly what I'm saying, that when you believe something, we call you a believer. I don't want to believe anything. I want to intellectually sit down at the library and read books on ancient theologies and religion and conceptual ideas and where they've come from and spend 60 years looking at the subject of religion. And finally, I got what I wanted. I wanted to know, and now I know. But now I'm aware, I am now being made aware that you might as well talk to yourself. If you know what's going on, you might as well talk to yourself. Why? Because if you talk to other people, you're going to end up talking to yourself. Nobody's going to want to hear what you're saying. Yeah. Nobody's going to care what, what you're saying. You know, nobody wants to hear the real truth. See, that's, that's the interesting I, thing I've said a lot of times is that, you know what, if you really start to talk to people about a lot of the things you discover – 
uh, uh, you will you will wind up kind of lonely because there are just uh-huh. not many people who want to hear the unvarnished truth. Now, uh, a couple of things really quickly here. here uh, I just put out on Twitter, and I also have the live chat room at Ocelli.com. If you want to email a question to either Jordan or myself, you can do that too. But if you want to ask a question right now uh, in the conversation, go right ahead, either at the live chat room at Ocelli.com or I am at Ocelli Effect on Twitter. And you can tweet a question to me, and uh, I will absolutely enter it into the conversation now. We do have a regular listener who is listening live that asked a question already. Um, and it's funny because I'm pretty sure this person has listened to every single one of these shows that we've done live. And I, I think that this has come up before and I, maybe they missed it. So let's go back over it because you were talking about the origins of things and, um, you know, and, and how it takes a lot of study to get it and how there are, you know, modern incarnations of different um, belief systems that have been sort of introduced and well superimposed over the original uh we we, we've talked about that many times they actually ask about a a subject here which again i think we covered this when we talked about jehovah's witnesses but maybe not um the rapture jordan Mm -hmm. okay so there is the concept of the rapture which they kind of explain here you know about this idea of ascending and we we know what we're talking about here uh They want to know where that idea comes from because they do not recall reading about it in the Bible. That that's that's the whole question. They don't recall reading about the Bible. There was a book, a very scholarly, well put together scholarly book, uh, came out many years ago, and I and I got a hold of it as soon as it came out because I know about these uh, subjects, and so I saw it. I thought that there's an interesting book. It was called The Rapture Cult. And it explained the story of where the rapture idea came from. And so <clears throat> the idea basically was what the Apostle Paul was talking about. Once you see the light on something, you are changed forever. Realize the actual truth of what you're seeing, that it will change your life and you'll be totally different. You'll be totally different once you see it. And so in the book, The Rapture Cult, the author talked about where the rapture idea came from. And he brought it back to in England. Uh, many, many years ago, there was a very, he ended up being uh, an alcoholic who was experiencing the DTs. <clears throat> she was beginning to see things because she was an alcoholic, a confirmed alcoholic. And she had all kinds of strange experiences because she was going through withdrawals or whatever. And But she was still very wealthy and her money was still spendable. And so the church always uh, respected her because she is the money of the church. She's financing the whole operation. And so they never said anything. They didn't try and do much to help her with her alcoholism. But they didn't mind taking the money that she was giving them. Oh, well, they, and, they never and, criticize and, the people that are actually paying their bills. I mean, come on. Yeah, and she's the one that was paying all the bills, so the church went along with it. Let her, let her be a drunk. It, uh, not going to change her, but if you if you try and stop her and try and clean her up, she's going to be very angry, and the, and the money's going to be shut off, and that's it. So just mind your own business. Let her be what she wants to be. As long as the checks are coming, don't bar, don't worry about it. And so she had a vision from the Lord, she said, when she was three sheets to the wind. She was an alcoholic, and when she was totally three sheets to the wind, she had a vision from the Lord, and the Lord told her that when you pass away, you're going to be raptured into heaven. That was the word that she said the Lord told her, that she would be raptured, and she's going to go to heaven from the earth, There will come a day when it's time for her to go, and she will go directly into heaven. That's what the Lord told her after the bottle of of whiskey. And uh, and so she kept ranting and raving about that to the clergyman in the church, that you need to teach this to the people. There's going to be a rupture. And I know because the Lord told me last night, after I finished those two bottles off, the Lord talked to me, and he told me there's going to be a rupture. And so it was actually an old lady, a wealthy old lady in England, 
as uh, from what I can remember from the book came out, out in the 60s. <clears throat> but there was an old lady in England who, uh, and the book is called The Rapture Cult. See if you can find it on the web. You might be able to order it from, from uh, the bookstore. The Rapture Cult. And she talked about how she told the clergy, look, I'm financing this church, or you teach the people what I'm telling you. You tell them there's going to be a rapture, and they're going to be raptured into heaven. And uh, and so the church clergymen, they started letting her talk, and they started promoting it. And it got to be so uh, so interesting and so delightful, other churches began teaching it. Before you know it, it was going all around town. This old lady's money had really struck a a, a, a nerve, and she was teaching the rapture the rapture and everybody else started teaching the rapture and so the churches they don't care one way or the other if it's true or not they just go along with the get along because after all it's just a it's just a business the church is in entertainment and that's what the people want to hear so we will tell them we will tell them and we'll in, inculcate that into our teachings so before you know it the whole idea of the rapture became the, the thing to do the, the subject to talk about and so Christians were talking about the rapture, when in point of fact, it was a drunk old lady with her money that caused the rapture to be taught. And it's in a book, and it's, got, and it's not the only book, incidentally. There have been other books written on the subject. But that was the first one I came across called The Rapture Cult. And, yeah, I think uh, and some, read it. Get it and read it yourself. I think there's some interesting uh, material on this as well at uh, Christianism dot com which is a website that uh you highly yeah. recommend as well uh and and you, you'll find information about this uh the, the the rapture it's an interesting story um and here's here's the odd part about this even in these uh you know the delusions of a drunken woman or some of the uh fables that are made up it, you know it, there, there there's a lesson there's a lesson and there's an interesting element that's usually built into them, like the concept of the rapture in the first place, right, Jordan? Um, mm-hmm. The idea of ascent into heaven. Well, a couple of reasons why there's an ascent into the heavens or into heaven itself. Well, that's where God is. I mean, according to everybody, ask a child, like you say, where's God? They'll point upward to the sky. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, there's that, but there's also... The idea of ascent that existed before Christianity, the concept of ascending, the concept of rising, the concept of being uplifted, lifting up. And indeed, when you do gain knowledge or when you do gain happiness, when you do, you can feel literally uplifted. I mean, yeah, it's built into our language, too. But uh, but what I'm saying is that it goes beyond that. There is a feeling of. Uh, being larger, being, you know, radiating almost, right? I mean, the concept of being thrilled, all of these things lend themselves to this concept of the ascent. So it's no wonder that, I mean, it might have been an uh, (laughs) alcohol-poisoned-fueled bit of imagination from this lady that started the concept. But the, the idea here is that a lot of people believe that you know, this is something they're waiting to just randomly happen at some point. You know, it's going to occur when the signs are right. When the end of the world comes, the good people are going to be raptured and everybody else is going to be here to face the the horrors, the terrors. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and, and but there's and always people love truth. that. People yeah. love that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful to know that I'm going to be getting out of here and you guys stay here and suffer through it. And I'm going to go into heaven with the Lord. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go with Lord Jesus. and I'm going to be in heaven. And, and it's going to be very un, uh, it's going to be very disappointing when you find out there is no Lord in heaven, there is no Jesus, there is no Lord in heaven. It's a symbolic story of the war between light and darkness, and you're in the dark, and you're still in the dark. And I'm trying to enlighten you, but you don't want to hear somebody who's who's trying to enlighten you. So you're saying, give us Barabbas in your head. Give us the the lie. We want to hear the wonderful story. We don't want to hear the truth and the light. <clears throat> so, well, but anyway, it also gets you know, into this idea, though, that there's advantages, right? Because th- that that's an interesting thing that that kind of just went through this whole discussion so far. This idea that you gain an advantage. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you're uh, if you're a Jew, you're you're one of the chosen people. You're you're separate. You're special. 
right? If, if you right. give money to that preacher on TV, hey, he's got a spot for you in heaven. You know, I mean, Visa or MasterCard, you can buy it. Uh, but but you have a special place. If you uh, you know follow these certain things, well, then you might get to actually rise up into the air and disappear with the rest of us. You know, you, you get to come along and be part of the club. Mm-hmm. It's, that's right, it's, and that's what we love. Humans love that to be part of the group. We want to be loved by our fellow man. We want to be appreciated, respected by our fellow man. And I said that on one of our very first. Very first shows I did, I brought that out, how children in school do not like to be laughed at and mocked because they don't know their lesson, they didn't study, they didn't do their homework, and now that the teacher is calling upon them, and they have to go up to the blackboard and do a problem for for the class that they're supposed to have studied the night before, but they didn't do their homework, and now all the kids in the class are going to laugh at this at this old child because he didn't do his homework and he doesn't know how to do what he's supposed to be doing. So then they're laughing at him, and no child wants to be laughed at and mocked by the class. Well, the same thing is true with adults. No adults like to be laughed at and ridiculed for being stupid because they said something dim-witted and stupid and people are laughing at him and now they mock him and laugh at him. Nobody likes to be mocked and laughed at because they said something foolish or stupid. And so that's why we don't say anything. We just keep our mouth shut and we go along to get along with the group. Wherever all of our friends are going, that's where we'll go. And whatever our friends are listening to, that's what we want to hear. Whatever our friends are, are eating, that's what we'll have. And so we want to be part of the group. We don't want to be laughed at and mocked by our fellow men and and put into a into a position where people are laughing at you. And that's typical of humans. We don't like being mocked and laughed at. We want to be appreciated by our fellow man. So we want to go to the ball game with everybody. When they're all drinking beer and going to the going to the ball game, we'll go too. So we can be a part of them and they'll love us. And that's why the scripture says if you continue to run with your friends after you learn the real truth, uh then then you're gonna find out they don't want you. They not they don't like you. They don't want you around them. Why? Because you know things they don't know. And you don't go with them to the ball games. You don't go with them to the beer drinking. You don't party with them. You don't have anything to do with them, and they know it, and they know that they are stupid, and they know that you're smart, and they don't want anything to do with you. And so this is why Jesus said, what they have done to me, they will do to you. If you start studying and educating yourself, and you find out the real truth, and and you are in the light, and you now got the light and the truth, you're going to find out that the slave is no greater than the master. What they have done to me, the son, they will do to you because the sun brings light into the world and we kill God's son. Do we nail him to a stake because we don't want to hear the truth and the light. So that's it. No, absolutely true. You know, one, one other thing about this, uh, this photo I started the conversation with about the flagellants and the whips and all this is um, that, you know, somebody said, well, gee, this looks like a lot of fun and, everything on this uh, holy and fun holiday where, you know, torture is being featured. Um, Somebody said, well, you know, what actually happened there is that the the Romans introduced the concept of paganism into the story. And I I almost fell over when I read that Um, (laughs) because paganism in, in this person's mind, because blood is being let in the act here, uh, it becomes pagan but um, I got some bad news for you if you haven't read your Bible lately. Um, there's a lot of bloodletting in the Bible of all sorts. Uh, you know, J- Jesus is not the only character to have been whipped. Uh, there, there is no, the sacrifice. The, the Old Testament is filled with, with mass killing. Yes. Mass killing. Uh, it's the Old Testament Bible is filled with. That kind of stuff. And oh, so, yeah. I mean, you, you know, one of the most brutal episodes to me was that whole uh, uh, incident at Shechem when, uh, when you know, okay, well, I'm going to take your daughter as my wife now to try and honor the fact that I have, uh, uh, you know, soiled her honor kind of yeah. thing. And then the brothers go in and murder everybody in the city, you know, and uh, it's, 
you know, while they're sitting there all sick from being circumcised, the men are kind of crippled because if you get, you know, circumcised as an adult, you're not in good shape afterwards. Uh, You know, so so here it is. Uh, Pretty brutal, indeed. Uh, The the music, too, right? Where, well, you know, hey, look, sacrifice your son on my altar. Um, Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, so so first altar boy. Yeah, the first altar. So, we, you know, to call this pagan is kind of funny because really what was pagan was uh, more of an adherence. I know this is a very tough topic for some people, but it was more of an adherence to what Jordan was initially talking about, which was this recognition of nature and the order That's of nature. That's precisely what the word pagan means in the line. Right. Go back to the Roman Empire. And I said to you before in explaining this, that when Caesar, when the Caesar of Rome decided he was going to be a Christian, everybody who was anybody like today in Washington, D.C., if the president becomes a member of something and he's decided of himself, he's going to be a member of something. Anybody who wants to be on his good side will join it with him. Because the boss is joining the Christians, so we'll be a Christian. We'll join, too. And if he's going to be in the Boy Scouts, well, we'll join the Boy Scouts, too. Because he, uh, this is what he wants. We'll be like him. We'll be his buddies and his friends. So we'll join, too. And this way, it keeps us in good with the boss. Because he'll like us. Because we are, you know, we're, we're adopting the same thing he wants. So we will do the same thing he's doing. So stay in good with Caesar. And so that's what happened. And so the people of the of the Roman Empire, the regular normal people of the Roman Empire out in the field, uh, the, the Romans who said that they were in the in crowd, they joined Christianity and now they're in with the Caesar of Rome. And they're worshiping in his religion, worshiping his God. He's a Christian and so are they. Now they are in the in crowd with Caesar, and they're very pompous and arrogant about how important they are because they're like Caesar now. They've accepted the same religion as Caesar. They've accepted all the stories like Caesar did. And so now we're we're his buddies and we're his friends. And so we are the in crowd. But the poor working class people out there around the empire and all the different countries around the around Rome and in Europe, who were just plain old working class people who had all of these ancient stories uh, handed down to them for thousands of years, they were referred to in Latin as pagans. Pagans simply meant people of the mountainside, people of the hills, out there around the countries of the world that Rome ruled, they were not like us. We are in, we're in the church. We have a connection with Caesar. We are important. We're the senators and the congressmen. We are important people. Why? Because we're in, we're in tight with the, with the boss. He is a Christian and we are too. And therefore, we don't want anything to do with those poor, unwashed, poor people out there in the hinterlands who believe and who are you know, just herding their sheep and providing us with food and providing us with, with uh, all of our needs of poor people who are working, they are not like us. So they are referred to in Latin as pagan. Pagan means people of the hillside, people of the hills. So therefore today we say the same thing. We are Christian. That means we are in type with the Lord. The Lord loves us. He don't care about the ancient Chinese or out in the middle of China. Never heard about the Lord. Because they're a bunch of pagans. Well, that's exactly what the Romans said about the people of their day. If you're not in Rome and you're not hobnodding and then sipping uh, the wine with the with Caesar, then that means you're a pagan. You are a person of the mountains. You're just a regular farmer. You're people of the hillside. And so that's what the word pagan meant. It doesn't mean you're yeah, evil or bad. It just means you're not like the, the, the in crowd. You don't like the Christians in the end crowd. And so that's where it all comes from. We're still the same arrogant pompous and arrogant people we've always been on the earth. We're still calling other people who are not like us pagans. 
And so that's the name of that tomb. But I was going to go on. I wanted to go on with this idea about Easter. Yeah, no, and I definitely the, want to get into that. In the ancient world, I was well, going to say in the go I, on. Hang we'll, on just we'll, a second, because you know we should really take the break now and uh, and and get into Easter as as a fresh topic, because the meaning of, of the word is interesting too. I think. Um, but you know, the, the concept of the hierarchy in Rome is, is really an intense thing that I think also needs to be gone back over a little bit because, uh, uh at, at the time Julius Caesar first, you know, became the emperor. Uh, the fact is that he had to reorganize everything because it was such a mess and, uh, uh, he ascended to a status there, but there was always a hierarchy. There was always this, you know, if you lived in Rome, then you were a Roman. You know, everything else was kind of everything else, regardless of the size of the empire. It wasn't uh, culturally inclusive at that time. There was a very extreme hierarchy. And even the people of Rome, who were the common people in Rome, uh, they were fully dependent on the state, fully dependent on the highest figure. And the decrees which came, you know, from the godlike figure, because Augustus would do that later, ascend himself to to the god status uh, after the senators decided to turn against Julius Caesar. <laughs> much mm-hmm. uh, much later, Augustus Caesar uh, would would definitely set things up. And of course, July and August are two months right there in the center of the calendar. Um, Julius so, and Augustus Caesar. Exactly. Augustus Caesar and Julius Caesar. Exactly. But I think we should get a lot deeper into the Easter topic. But we're going to take this break really quick and give you the full hour to uh, <laughs> to go into this Easter topic. And also, you guys still can ask questions either on Twitter or in the chat room at Ocelli.com. Either way, uh, while we're live on the air, if you email them to us afterwards or, you know, my emails at info at Ocelli.com. But you have to actually go to Jordan Maxwell show dot com and email Jordan. You can always ask questions in between these shows, but we love to see what it is you're thinking while you're listening. So uh, either way, though, we accept the questions and and I will read them in if you send them to me. So either way, uh, let's continue on with this discussion of Easter the day after Easter (laughs) here on the Ocelli Effect with Jordan Maxwell. We're continuing, actually, the series on religion, special dogmatic theology, which is what I've been calling it for quite a while. And uh, I know I've learned a lot and hopefully you have and will. Say now here at Ocelli.com. Now, I got to say something. It is Monday, and I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of stuff. But later on in the week, we're going to talk about a way that uh, maybe you can get involved directly in spreading the word about the show. I've mailed out a couple of little goodie packages to people under certain conditions. And uh, uh, if I have money for postage this week, I'll continue to do so. But we'll talk about that on a show later in the week. For now, I have Jordan Maxwell with me, and I want to get right back to it after I remind you that uh, there's only one website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's website on the Internet, and it is JordanMaxwellShow.com. Yes, you have to put all three of those words together into one word, Jordan Maxwell Show, and then .com. And if you go there, there is the uh, Research Society, which you can join for a one-time fee. Now, that money goes to help the webmaster who is putting up a whole lot of data, uh, a a ton of research, articles, images, uh, video, audio, all kinds of stuff that is up there in the Jordan Maxwell Research Society section of the website. But you got to actually join to get in there. I am a member. Uh, However, there's other stuff on JordanMaxwellShow.com, including a, uh, you know, a, a donate button an email button where you can just contact Jordan directly if you like. Uh, it could be that uh, that, that you, there's some question you want to ask that you don't want to a- answer it on the air. I don't know. Jordan likes to hear from people, by the way, who uh, who appreciate him. I know that. 